Good evening, Thanks. everyone. We're just going to give everybody a moment just to connect before we get started. And just wanting to remind everyone that this is a webinar format, so we cannot see or hear you. Um, so don't worry if you're going to be enjoying your dinner during this next hour. Um, and that said, there will be opportunities, though, to connect through the chat or the Q&A function. And uh, but uh, bear with us and we'll get started in just a moment. Thank you so much for joining. I think um, I'm going to start. And so I'd like you to, I'd like to welcome you to the 2022 AGM for the Canadian Canoe Museum. We're here, so glad you could join us. My name is Victoria Grant and I'm the chair of the Canadian Canoe Museum Board of Directors. Before we begin, I'd like to start with our land acknowledgement and the Canadian Canoe Museum respectfully acknowledges that we are situated on the Treaty 20 Mishi Sagi territory and the traditional territory covered by the Williams Treaty's First Nations. The CCM also recognizes the contributions of the Métis, the Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples in shaping this, country, this community and country as a whole. We have members all over the country, and so we encourage you to also recognize whose land you are joining us from by typing it into the chat. As an organization that stewards the largest and most significant collection of canoes, kayaks, and paddled watercraft, we will honor and share the cultural histories and stories within the collection and all that we do. And lastly, before we get down to business, thank you for being here at our annual general meeting. This is the last AGM while still at 910 Monaghan Road. The organization of the Canadian Canoe Museum is in its 25th year, and it is on the cusp of transitioning from this facility, which has been our home, to our new home across town on the waterfront of Little Lake. On behalf of the board, thank you for your continued support and interest in the, in the museum. At this point, I'll turn it over to Kate Kensington, Development Officer, to walk you through the technical, de de technical details on how this meeting will be run. Kate. Thank you, Vicki. Um, the AGM should last less than an hour and will be followed by a presentation reflecting on 2021 and a progress update on the new museum. We have a lot of people joining us today, both across the country, and as it is a webinar, your camera and microphones will remain off. Please also note that the meeting is being recorded. The automatic closed captioning is on for accessibility. However, if you would like to turn it off for yourself, click the CC button at the bottom of your screen and then hide subtitles. We will be explaining the voting process and technical considerations in a moment, but please note if you are experiencing any technical issues, we do have staff standing by to support you. You can ask a question in the chat located at the bottom of your screen and we will do our absolute best to help you. Um, we will begin by asking everyone to type your full name in the chat box now if you have not done so already so that we can record your attendance and determine quorum. Thank you and I'll now pass it back over to our chair, Victoria Grant. Thank you. It is my pleasure to call our AGM to order. All members who are, were in good standing 30 days in advance of our AGM are eligible to vote. 
and received an AGM package, the agenda, proxy form, minutes from last year, and audited financial statements by email or viewed them on the dedicated AGM page, web page. This package also this package included all resolutions that will be debated or voted on upon today. Our quorum is 20 members or 10% of members, whichever is the lowest. We, now, we, ha we have 485 memberships in good standing. So therefore 20 members constitute quorum. Kate, can you confirm we have 20 members or more present? Yes, Madam Chair, I am pleased to confirm we have more than 20 members present. As outlined in our virtual AGM processes that was distribute, distributed by email to all members, we are using an assumed consent voting process. Therefore, we will be assuming all members in, in attendance or voting by proxy are voting in favor of motions unless objections are otherwise made which I will ask each time and leave a pause for people to object. Members of the board of directors will be moving and seconding motions. If you would like to object to a motion, please enter your objection under the chat using the chat function. Please note to ensure we can keep discussion and the meeting moving, we, we request that you keep any inquiries to one question and one follow-up per person per agenda item. Today's agenda was pre-circulated in advance of this meeting. Our proposed agenda is approval of the 2021 annual meeting, meeting minutes from Wednesday, June 16th, 2021. Approval of the 2021 audited financial statements election of board of directors, update on the annual report, consideration of any other business as may come before the meeting, adjournment of the AGM. Motion number one, may I have a motion from a director to approve the agenda? Madam Chair, I, Val McCray, move that the agenda be approved. Is there a seconder for the motion? Uh, Madam Chair, it's Jocelyn Brown and I second the motion. Are there any questions or discussion of the agenda before we proceed to voting? If you would like to object to this motion, please type your objection in the chat. Uh, Madam Chair, it's uh, Kevin Malone. Can we just add the approval of the appointment of auditors for 2022 to the agenda, please? It was just missed. Oh, right. I, it is actually on it. I just didn't read it. Okay, thank you. So seeing no objections, the motion has passed with recognizing that I didn't read in the approvement of the auditors. Thank you. The Canadian Canoe Museum AGM minutes were sent to all members by email in advance of this meeting. May I have a motion from a director to approve personally? I think Dad and I would like to be the ones to communicate. Madam Chair, I, Brian Badagig, move that the minutes of the last annual meeting of the members held on June 16, 2021 be approved. Is there a seconder for this motion? Uh, your kids? That's me personally. I'm not speaking for Dad. Is there a seconder for this motion? Madam Chair, I'm happy to be the seconder. It's uh, Kevin Malone and I second the motion. Thank you. 
Are there any questions or discussion of the minutes before we proceed with voting? If you would like to object to this motion, please type your objection in the chat. Are there any objections to this motion? The motion has passed, thank you. I will now introduce the director and treasurer, Kevin Malone, to discuss the 2021 audited financial statements. Thank you, Vicki. My name is uh, Kevin Malone. I'm the treasurer of the Canadian Canoe Museum. Uh, we have completed our financial year ending December 31st, 2021. Members received the audited financial statements by email and on the AGM webpage in advance of this meeting. Here are some highlights. Coming out of 2020, the museum continued to be shut down for much of 2021 due to COVID. However, the online store and virtual tours continue to perform well, and we ended the year with operational expenses over revenues of just under 50,000. For this, we thank all levels of government for their continued pandemic assistance of 550,000 in 2021. We are lucky to have the continued support of our generous donors as we purchased the Johnson site for 1.575 million, and prepare the new site for construction, which began in October. Over 5 million in donations shows us that just how much the community cares about this project and the showcasing of our wonderful collection. The new museum ended the year strong with excess of revenues over expenses totaling 7.5 million, which will be contributed directly into the continued construction in 2022. We we're also able to take advantage of previous exhibition design work at no extra cost, which is shown in the statement of operations as a recovery of pre-construction costs. The campaign, the capital campaign for the Johnson site has raised to date just over 35 million through donations and investment from all four levels of government, private donors, corporations, and foundations from across the country. We have project financing in place, we continue to manage the capital project budget with vigilance, despite the challenging environment that construction projects are in. It is our plan to have raised the full project costs prior to opening the new museum next summer. And we thank everyone for their support and look forward to sharing our journey with you. Are there any questions about the audited financial statements? If there are no questions, Madam Chair, I, Kevin Malone, move to approve the Canadian Canoe Museum's 2021 audited financial statements. Do any of my fellow directors second this motion? I, Tim Rutherford, second the motion. Thank you, Tim. We proceed with voting. There is a question, and the question is, why have pre-construction costs been expensed versus being capitalized? Emily, do you want to take that on or do you want me to answer it? I can, I, I can answer There are a number of expenses, um, including consulting expenses, uh, some design expenses um, that um, are expensed and not capitalized. Um, so we've included those as, as um, non-capitalized expenses.
Not seeing any other questions. If you would like to object to this motion, please type your objection in the chat. Are there any objections? The motion has passed. Thank you. Uh, the Canadian Community Museum would like to reappoint Grant Thornton as our audit firm for 2022 based on the recommendation of the Finance and Audit Committee. Motion number four, Madam Chair. I, Kevin Malone, move to approve Grant Thornton as the auditor for the Canadian Community Museum for fiscal 2022. Do any of my fellow directors second this motion? I, Tim Rutherford, second this motion. Thank you, Tim. Are there any questions or discussions before we proceed with voting? If you would like to object to this motion, please type your objection in the chat. Are there any objections? The motion has passed. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. I will now provide an update on the status of our board of directors. Our bylaws allow us to have a minimum of 16 and no more than 18 board members. Today's nominations along with returning directors will bring the board up to 17 members. Any persons to be elected as directors must have been proposed in advance of this meeting by the governance and nominating committee or by the members as provided in the museum's bylaws. Three new directors have been proposed by the Governance and Nominating Committee, and a brief, brief biography of each nominee was included in the meeting package. Doris Stammel. Doris is a certified corporate director and a seasoned professional and executive with more, more than 30 years of experience working in a leading professional and consulting services organization. Doris has been a longstanding member of Ernst & Young LLP's executive committee and its chief legal counsel with deep exper expertise in governance, risk management, ethics, compliance, strategy and business planning and execution and talent management. She is deeply passionate about diversity, equity and inclusion and has been recognized for her long trek track record of championing the next generation of female leaders. Doris is a past member of cabinet of the United Way of Toronto and New York region, where she co-chaired its Women's United initiative. Doris is an avid canoeist and camper who has for many years together with her husband and family, enjoyed canoe camping in Algonquin Park and paddling at her family cottage in Halliburton. Garth Walbridge. Garth is a Métis man born in the Red River settlement who has lived in Yellowknife Northwest Territories for over 40 years. He is a proud father of a daughter who is a family physician in Fort Smith, who Northwest Territories, who has three, three children, making him a Mushim, the Michif word for grandfather, a role which makes him exceptionally happy. Michif is his mother's language and the language of the Métis. His son is a CPA who lives and works in Montreal. The Hudson Bay archives show that seven of his forefathers were canoe men and two of them had the added job description as Cree interpreters. Garth likes to joke that he as a lawyer hopes that the added job duty entitled them to extra pay. Garth has lived in Nunavut and the Northwest Territory since he was a young man, driving his sled dog team on Hudson Bay and racing on the Great Slave Lake. He is a dog sled and snowshoe builder as well as a wooden canoe rebuilder. His wife, Pat, also Métis from Manitoba, is loving, 
lovingly known as the director of finance. She does have an MBA, has gently urged him to stop acquiring old wooden canoes until he gets more of his sizable inventory rebuilt. His law practice today, he part-time as he heads towards return, retirement is becoming more and more focused on wills and estates for indigenous people and serving on board of directors. Our third is Phyllis Williams. Phyllis Williams is currently the manager of health and social services at Alderville First Nation. She has many years of experience of, in this field, having worked for Curve Lake First Nation in the same capacity and for Hiawatha First Nation as assistant manager. She served seven years as the former elected chief of Curve Lake First Nation and as a council member for 16 years. Phyllis's extensive career spans work in various fields, including economic and employment development, post-secondary administration, arts and culture, community development, governance, and public health. These rich and fulfilling experiences inclusive of volunteer and committee opportunities over many, many years has enabled her, her to have direct contact with clients and agents, agencies, leaders, elders, provincial and federal connections. Through these experiences, she has learned the political landscape while challenging herself to achieve higher levels of leadership. Phyllis is an advocate for her community and she's spoken about the need for cleaning drinking water for Curve Lake. While chief, she served as an advisory ambassador and assisted fundraising efforts for the Canadian Canoe Museum. She also, accomp also accomplished with four Mishisaki chiefs the Treaty 20 settlement of the flooded land claim and was one of the six Mishisaki and Chippewa chiefs who settled the Williams Treaty 23 negotiated claim with the federal and provincial governments. She was Curve Lake's First Nations representative for Peterborough Public Health Board of Directors and served on the board as chair, deputy chair and committee chairs. Phyllis was influential, was influential in the Peterborough Regional Health Center strategic planning and served on the board of director, providing the indigenous voice and met with the CEO, CEO regular, regularly to assure quality and culturally sensitive services for the indigenous population. Phyllis loves the beauty of Peterborough County, Mother Nature's gifts of lakes, waters, animals, and wildlife this region offers. She continues to appreciate the history and contributions of our First Nations in this country and the teaching shared by Indigenous leaders, elders, and knowledge keepers. Six of our current directors are up for re-election. Their names are Victoria Grant, Jenny Ingram, Kevin Malone, Rafe Richardson, Deborah Jacobs, and John Ronson. Our other directors are mid-term in their service. Thank you, Meredith, Jocelyn, Brown, Brian Groves, Tim Rutherford, Brian Budigig, Kate Farnell, Robert James, and Val McRae. Nominated for election as directors of the museum commencing as of today's date are Doris Stammel, Garth Walbridge and Phyllis Williams for the first, uh, for a first term of two years. Victoria Grant, Jenny Ingram, Kevin Malone and Rafe Richardson for a third term of two years. And Deborah Jacobs and Ron, John Ronson for a fourth term of two years. Since there can be no further nominations as per our bylaws, I declare the nominations closed. All those who have been nominated have consented to act as directors of museum. So I do declare those nominated to be duly elected directors of the museum by acclamation to hold office until the expiry of their respective terms for which they are elected and, or until their successors are elected or appointed, whichever occurs first. Thank you to all of the board members and to our members. 
Our team is currently working on our 2021 annual report to share the journey of this past year. And it will be available on our website and circulated by email this summer. After our formal business concludes, Carolyn and Jeremy, Jeremy will be reflecting on 2021 further and providing a new museum project update. No resolutions or consideration of other business were raised ahead of this meeting. Kate, do we have any lingering questions from the chat that need to be addressed? No, Vicki, I've not seen anything in the chat or in the, the Q&A. Thank you. And that wraps up the official portion of our AGM. We will officially adjourn the business portion of the meeting. May I have a motion from a director to adjourn the meeting? Madam Chair, I, Phyllis Williams, move that the meeting be adjourned. Is there a second for this motion? I, Doris Tamil, second this motion. The more motion has passed, and I will call the formal business of our 2022 AGM to a close. So, um, oh, so I, I'm going to begin by um, this, before we move into the next part, I would um, like to thank you all for being here um, and for participating in the AGM. It's great to have such a great turnout. I'm sorry we couldn't do it in person, um, but before I move forward, I am going to announce that Kevin, Kevin Malone will be our incoming chair in 2023. Kevin has been with the BMO Financial Group for over 30 years in its senior leadership roles with two business groups, BMO Private Banking and BMO Capital Markets. Kevin began his banking career at BMO in the corporate banking in 1985 and moved to the investment banking group in 2000, where he was a senior relationship manager in two industry sectors, media and telecommunications and the diversified industries where he advised public and privately owned Canadian companies with respect to mergers and acquisitions, recapitalizations, debt, and equity financing. Kevin has joined, joined BMO Private Banking in 2009 and is currently responsible for the overall leadership and strategy of ultra high net worth group in the greater Toronto area. With many years of experience serving corporate and ultra and high net worth clients, Kevin and his team work with wealthy Canadian families and assist in managing their complex wealth management needs. Kevin has an MBA from the Richard Ivey School of Business, the University of Western Ontario, and a Bachelor of Art Honours from Queen's University, and a certificate from the Sauter School of Business Family Enterprise Advisor Program at the University of British Columbia. Kevin is, an active, is active in the community. He's a trustee of Lakefield College School, a director and past present, president of Duke and of Edinburgh Award Programs National Board and has served on fundraising committees for a number of years for not-for-profit organizations, including the Nature Conservancy of Canada, Stratford Express and Dixon Hall. Kevin is a recipient of Her Majesty the Queen Golden Jubilee Medal 2002 and the Diamond Jubilee Medal of 2012. Kevin and his wife Mona are proud parents to three children and as a family are actively involved in amateur sports, travel, the arts and numerous charitable organizations. Kevin joined the board in 2018 and has been the finance and audit committee chair since 2019 and is also the fund fundraising cabinet chair for the new um, museum project. We're now going to move into a presentation by Carolyn and Jeremy um, as they look back on 2021 and give us some insight into the new museum. Carolyn and Jeremy. Mm. Lovely. 
thank you very much, Vicki. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us tonight and giving us an opportunity to give you a fulsome review of 2021 and also give you a little glimpse into some of the work that's been taking place over the last six months um, as we're into 2022. Um, so this is uh, the informal portion of the evening. So um, I'm hoping we can build a bit of rapport and, and have, a, have a nice update. And please, I am encouraging you to pose questions in the Q&A so that we can, um, we can answer some of them at the end of, of this presentation and, um, and offer where we can't be in person, we can at least have a good uh, chat back and forth. So um, 2021, I'm just going to get right into it here, and, and Jeremy and I are going to go back and forth, but I'm going to I'm going to get us going here. Um, 2021 is a year that is marked by a number of absolutely extraordinary moments in this organization's history. It was a year that we made significant progress on the new museum project to bring this organization to its new waterfront home on Little Lake in Peterborough. And the thing that I find most remarkable about 2021 in reflecting on it is that we were doing all of this while all of us were in the middle of a global pandemic and dealing with the challenges and the stresses that the global pandemic um, brought forward to us. And the, the efforts to move this organization to its new waterfront home were also, I think, enhanced by the last 25 years that we've had to operate at our current facility. And so I do want to celebrate um, and take a few moments here just to give a shout out to the work that took place in 2021 because not only is there all the major milestones for the new museum project, but there were huge milestones that, and achievements in, in the operations of the physical canoe museum at 910 Monaghan Road. And while many of us were not able to deliver programming in person, like tonight, we were forced to put most of our programming online and this is a slide that is simply just to illustrate, this is high level, bare bones, some of the items that occurred over the course of 2021. You're gonna see this in the annual report when it comes out in July, but essentially there were many moments of New Museum and 910 Monaghan Road that, that really brought forward the excellence that I think the Canoe Museum should be proud of. It is work that was um, that allowed us to expand our reach nationally and um, looking specifically at the kind of programming we were able to do. And the virtual programming, so this is year two for us. If we're thinking 2020, we pivoted our most of our in-person programming to virtual. 2021, we built on that. We were continuing to deal with the ups and downs, the opens and closes, thanks to the pandemic. And yet, and there was also this increased ramp up of new museum. So I'm just going to focus um, a few here and then I'll hand it over to Jeremy. But our virtual school programming. So this is Jen Bernard in the, you can see under my cursor here, delivering to an iPad, a, a group of students. So between Jen and Karen, they delivered virtual programming to over 1400 students across Canada during the many ups and downs and opens and closes in 2021. They were also instrumental in helping facilitate the virtual programming and the virtual tours that Jeremy and others took part in over the course of the year. We had James Raffin uh, delivering and start kicking off, I guess, um, initiated and kicked off a na National Council in Conversation program. So there were four National Council members that James interviewed as part of a series of how to, how to bring these 
brilliant minds that are on our national council to the rest of the world. And the national council in conversation was just one way of doing so. And then our virtual store. So we've got Paul and Mary Rose down in the bottom middle here. And thanks to Beth and her extraordinary work, our online store and in-person store have done exceptionally well over the last two years. And we could not have imagined such better success. And a lot of, um, as Kevin was, was recounting, we oper the operating fund did finish in the black for the second pandemic year in a row. And we, um, it, has, it has been a full team effort to make that happen through admissions, through tourism, through our store, through the, um, the outreach that we've been doing, and certainly the efforts of the staff team to make sure that, again, they're bringing excellence to everything that they're doing. So really pleased with how the store has been coming along and kudos to Beth and the team for making that all happen. And Jeremy, can you show us some of these other slides that are in here as well? Be delighted to, thank you, Carolyn. And I am um, delighted to be joining you. I'm actually, as you, some of you will recognize, joining you from uh, the museum's current collection storage hall. This is a 20,000 square foot uh, facility that used to be the location where Outboard Marine Corporation did plating and finishing of its outboard motors and now is a resting place for about 500 canoes and kayaks. So uh, as Carolyn mentioned, a lot of support has come in that's been quite transformative. The Ontario Trillium Foundation has been with us for many years and supporting operations uh, and a really transformative program that uh, we've been able to implement with their support has been the refurbishment and the enabling digitization and, and digital connectivity in our collection storage in order to allow for spacing to keep um, people distance and out of, out of traffic routes of visitors while we've been able to be open and to really use this space in so many ways, why would we want to um, invest heavily in a tired old facility as we're planning to move? Well, it turns out that this, uh, this grant, this support has been more valuable than we could have ever imagined. You can see up in the upper left, uh, the, the scraping and prepping before the floors were finished and painted. Uh, and then all of the digital uh, systems brought into place for the connectivity. So um, this has been absolutely pivotal to uh, the museum to host uh, digital tours, virtual tours uh, and engagement nationally and, um, and beyond from this space. You perhaps have seen some of our recorded offerings uh, from this place. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, and I'm, uh, I would not have been able to join you tonight uh, uh, from this location were it not for their support. One other thing that this, um, this support has really supported and enabled for us is to welcome knowledge holders uh, and, and experts into the museum and into the collection storage to sit and do interviews. In the lower left, if you attended our construction commencement, you would remember Marcel Labelle, um, Métis knowledge holder, canoe maker. Uh, he was our keynote at the commencement and here he is with Karen and Laura and a few others off screen um, being interviewed and sharing some stories, some of which will be uh, featured in our upcoming exhibits at the new museum. But this uh, expanded capacity has also allowed us to travel the country, not physically, but in the lower right, you can see Laura and I, uh, MJ's uh, actually operating the camera, but was participating in this call. And we're meeting canoe makers across the country and exploring collections right here at the Canoe Museum digitally uh, and trying to find opportunities for sharing, sharing knowledge, reciprocity, and so on. This is an instance where we're looking at a Tanaja uh, bark canoe uh, from Creston, British Columbia. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and so, in fact, a lot of this work, while we've just been sort of expanding our reach, while we've been in a fairly quiet phase over, over the duration of the pandemic, has really gone into support of our exhibits. And I'm going to get to the exhibits in a moment, but I just want to speak to a, a few other uh, major efforts that are taking place behind the scenes. Perhaps you've caught a little bit of chatter about this, but we are currently building a new museum, as you know. Um, we're fundraising uh, towards that project, of course. We're also developing the exhibits for this new museum and preparing to move the whole operation onto a new waterfront site. We're also preparing, uh, as you can imagine, the world's largest collection of canoes, kayaks, paddled watercraft, 
and related artifacts from one location to the other. And we have an amazing team uh, working hard behind the scenes, also led by Beth Stanley, but we have um, expanded capacity to this, Dane Allendorf, uh, Dane Van Exen, and Jen Bernard, uh, as well as a, a stalwart team of volunteers who joined us over the winter while we were working in the main building. And this is uh, really important work. We have one moment while we are handling every single object in the entire collection, pulling it from a rack, cleaning it, condition reporting it, doing any temporary stabilization if required, cataloging, uploading to the digital database, photographing, and then ultimately fitting with a, a specialized cradle, as you can see in the lower left. This is a moment where we can take stock of everything that is in our care and, um, and carry forward the information we need to go forward. It, to do this at any other time is just such a prohibitive amount of work. So just really grateful to the team who've been working behind the scenes. It's not a flashy job uh, typically seen by the public. Then a bit of an update to our membership here tonight um, uh, and, a, and a progress report. Proud to report that the team were now past 400 canoes that have been fully prepared for transit, except they have not yet been fitted with cradles. We'll be starting to do that later this month. Uh, but meanwhile, um, before we get into some of the larger canoes and the canoes uh, that are currently on exhibit that we won't get to until the fall, um, I'm delighted to say that uh, all of the artifacts in the small artifact rooms have been prepared for travel, as have 90 boxes of archival materials prepared for transfer, and all in, 80% of the small artifacts, all of the associated equipment, such as paddles, oars, sailing rigs, uh, tools, canoe making tools, uh, camping and expedition equipment, carvings and artwork, they have all been prepared for travel, documented and um, housed into shipping crates to be moved into the new museum. Really exciting. So kudos to the team. Really proud of your work and really proud to be uh, working with such a great group of people. And how about another uh, enormous body of work that's happening behind the scenes? Um, this would be uh, speaking to the exhibits and uh, I don't get the time needed to do a deep dive into this tonight um, at tonight's AGM, but I will touch on a few things. 2021 saw us um, wrapping up with our exhibit design partners GSM project saw us wrapping up the schematic design stage of exhibition development. Um, and so some of the renderings that we featured here are taken from that document. This was an amazing amount of work uh, that we, we worked on throughout the course of the year. Of course, we expanded our team last year. So um, if you don't know, these are Beth Stanley, Laura Pierce, Mary Jane Prue, uh, Karen Taylor, of course, our executive director, Carolyn Hislop, and James Raff, and uh, we couldn't imagine doing these exhibits with you, without you. Um, uh, of course, without you, my dear James, uh, you are a mentor and a, and, a, and, a, and a muse for this project in so many ways. We're also working on these exhibits with people locally and across the country, and you will see those relationships expressed uh, in this exhi in exhibit hall, this 20,000 square foot exhibit hall, uh, in so many different ways. Since January, we've launched full steam into the design development stage. Um, this will uh, launch us into production drawings and fabrication into the latter part of summer. And uh, this is a fast and furious process where we're, we're bringing forward images, we're uh, working out the final details of the circulation routes, the fit out elements within the spaces, uh, and all of the, the graphic panels, et cetera. It's a really exciting time. And um, the development model has shifted a little bit and we'll get into that uh, at, a, at a future meeting, no doubt, but very excited about where things stand here. Um, if you look at the lower left, you'll see that um, it's too small to see the numbering perhaps. You've seen the slide in, in some other talks that we've given. There are six principal thematic zones within this exhibit hall uh, for the long-term exhibits where we're exploring ideas or thematic concepts um, throughout this hall, there is going to be a balance or a parity of Indigenous and non-Indigenous representation. That's through watercraft, faces, voices, narratives, or uh, personal stories. Uh, and that's a, a really important um, framework that these exhibits are being developed towards. And to do so, then we have, uh, we have partners in this project. These are community coordinators and experts and knowledge holders across this country supporting that. And this is supporting a workflow of imagery, 
recorded audio stories, videography, some commissioned pieces that are going to be featured in the exhibits, content, narrative guidance. Uh, in the upper right of is a little number seven and one, can one canoe featured. That is actually the temporary exhibit zone. And that's uh, the first outing of that is gonna be the remarkable journey of the Canadian Canoe Museum written across three chapters of its existence. First at a summer camp at Kanawa under the directorship of Kirk Whipper. Uh, here then at 910 Monaghan at an old outboard motor factory and the remarkable journey, I don't need to tell you that it has been of the shift from where we are now into our new home. And just one last thing to, to really mention here uh, about these exhibits, very exciting. Part of the workflow that's happening right now in design development is the collaboration and partnerships we have across the country as pieces and components are starting to flow in. Delighted to tell you that we have recently received a uh, Pouvernitouk style kayak or kayak made at Ikarsivik High School in Pouvernitouk, Northern Quebec. Uh, this is an amazing 20 year program led by Alain Cloutier in that community. It arrived at air cargo flight and it will be exhibited in the upper left exhibit zone accompanying a, a kayak made by makers, their grandchildren, the grandparents age 50 years earlier. Also later this month, if you happen to be uh, driving through Kedji in uh, Nova Scotia, you will meet Todd and Melissa Labrador, master canoe makers who are making a 21 foot ocean going Mi'kmaq birch bark canoe that'll be featured in a making exhibit and bringing their knowledge uh, and, and canoe, uh, but also videography and documentation of work into that space. So many exciting things being shared and being brought into this space. All right, next slide, Carolyn. Sort of unbelievable, eh? Um, what is being accomplished well, all of this other bit is going on behind the scenes. So the organization really, um, so we have exhibits well underway. 2021 was marked by the exhibition development getting underway and into a position where we are back on, we're on schedule and we're ready to put them into the new museum. We've got the collection being prepped and moved and we've got a very strict spread schedule of when uh, quantities need to be ready. And we wanna have the 100% of our watercraft collection prepared and on its cradle for September of this year. And of course we haven't, we don't have a, a slide to this, but programs, this is a huge component of what is going to be offered at the new museum. So what is the experience that the visitor is gonna have when they arrive? The programs are well underway and are being developed right now by our awesome team, Jen Bernard and Karen Taylor, with some peppering of the rest of the team in and where possible. And there'll be a lot more coming out over the next couple of months from the programs team. And then of course, um, there's the actual construction of this new museum. And in 2021, I just wanna walk you back a, a few, few steps here. In 2021, so this is just last year, which I find a little bit shocking when I think of how quickly time is going and how fast paced everything is. But January of last year, January of 2021, this top slide represents us kicking off this is a Zoom screen with us kicking off the validation phase of the entire project. So we, we opted to go with an integrated project delivery model, which essentially is a construction model whereby the design team and the building team and all the specialist consultants plus the owner, which is us, are all at the same table at the same meeting and we're collaborating to bring the most value possible back to the project. And we're working to, um, to the common goal of everybody benefiting. And so this, uh, because of the pandemic, this was um, Shando's construction. This is the first virtual big room. So every Tuesday, many of you know this, that Carolyn and Jeremy are totally not available or else they're seriously multitasking, which we shouldn't be, but we are to and we're sitting in a zoom for eight plus hours a day with the whole project team and this is many of the faces that have been with us since 2021 um, and these folks are are working to design and build the new museum with us in this collaborative way and so um, really neat to see integrated project delivery 
totally carried out virtually and um, Bill Lett and I actually delivered a um, delivered a talk about the uh, the benefits and challenges of of virtual big rooms um, in the integrated project delivery model sometime uh, in 2021. Um, infusing the team, so the bottom right image here is infusing the team um, when we could meet in person with the collection. So immersing them in the space, getting the whole team to understand the complexities of such a large water, watercraft collection and in particular, how to move it into this new building um, that is a two floor museum and how to do that within a very tight schedule and, and a very tight budget as well. And um, 2021 also marked, um, it's so interesting. So this is June of 2022. Um, so about one year ago, uh, this board met as a group and we all approved the validation report that this museum could be built for a certain amount of money in a certain amount of time and meeting the scope that we had laid out for it. That was, that was four months after we started this validation process. Shortly after that, um, and just actually, sorry, just before that in early April, we carried out a virtual public meeting um, first one the museums ever had to do with the city of Peterborough and the community members to get the Johnson property rezoned. Of course, Kevin has already mentioned this, but we purchased Johnson property in early January. So early January, we bought land, we started validation. June, we got our validation report, we agreed to it. Um, and then we started putting all the mechanisms in place. So come May, the city of Peterborough actually approved the site plan application and they actually at the same time approved continuing to support the capital um, the capital funding for the new museum project at four million dollars and then by October this is a hilarious shot of me this is just you know there's nothing fancy about my office but here I am signing our construction contract in October digitally of course no pomp and ceremony just me at my sad desk, hand sanitizer in the background, signing our major construction contract. That then led to this top left picture, which I quite love. It's one of the big moments, um, I think, in 2021 for me personally was having a construction fence up and being able to put a sign on the construction fence and that this is a notice to our community that this museum is coming to you at Johnson site. Shortly after that, here is a beautiful shot of Vicky at our construction commencement ceremony, sharing this beautiful evolution of the project um, with our community of donors and supporters and members and volunteers and staff and um, all the people that were just walking by on probably one of the worst weather days in October, but it was a beautiful day. The weather held off and we had a really beautiful ceremony. It was gorgeous. So that marked construction commencement, um, which of course the behind the scenes to you as members is that that triggered federal funding to be released, that triggered provincial funding to be released, municipal funding and county funding. and when we were starting validation at the beginning of 2021 that was a big piece of what we were validating is whether this project could actually meet the funding milestones that we had already been set up with and and i can happily report we're in june of 2022 that um, all of our funding partners are so pleased with the progress and that we've been able to meet all of the requirements of the different granting and funding programs of our government partners which is um is no small feat it's been a it's been a big move and then i will just finish with this lovely picture of jeremy and i standing with our ppe on on top of this beautiful pile of ash logs this is the bottom right and sort of middle to the middle picture oh where's my cursor there it is there um so the site soon after construction commencement began to be cleared for construction um, and so part of that clearing was to talk to the team about whether we could salvage a number of ash logs and use that ash 
in the new museum in some way and capacity. And I'm happy to report we've got, I think, I don't know, we have way too many ash boards. I'm not sure where they're all gonna get used, but we have beautiful ash boards and they're gonna be put into these stunning benches that are gonna be throughout the property, outdoor benches. And we're actually talking with the architects right now about different elements within the building that, um, that could benefit from using this wood so that it doesn't all just get lost and we're able to carry some of that that story forward in, in the different elements in the building. And so we'd love to, you've all seen the major renderings. I know you have, you've seen the four renderings which show the two inside and this one, and then there's a beautiful one of the outdoor terrace. Um, we wanna give you an architectural inside perspective of what the what the building actually looks like from from a builder's point of view and so we're going to take you through a fly through very soon but before we do that i just we've been really working on the outdoor campus and the outdoor campus is this element of the project that we really we haven't really brought that to you folks we don't get to do enough updates but we wanted to make sure that um, you're aware of this is an area of the project that we're spending a lot of time and energy on right now. And to really bring to life the outdoor space, because this is the transformative moment. This is what the land on the waterfront is what makes this project sing. The building is stunning, but the outdoor spaces and how that is going to change the way this museum is inherently is is what um is what we're we're really excited about so we have about 1200 feet of waterfront five acres just over five acres we've got the trans canada trail running through the property here and jeremy interrupt me we are now just starting to lay out all of the other elements that we wanted to have that we imagine being essential to this to this campus. So the docking, so a huge T dock right out the western point that is for tandem boats, but also for accessible an accessible access to get folks um, with mobility issues in and out of their canoes and kayaks safely and effectively. We've got a small dock on the Whitlaw Creek side, which is for the big canoes to be in the water so that we can easily offer big canoe programming, which is really, um, is a very accessible way of, of getting new paddlers into a comfortable canoe and out onto the water. And then up here in the top um, under my cursor is a sort of a walk-in area for those of us that are used to getting our feet wet when we're getting in and out of a canoe or a kayak and want to land on some sand. This is where that's going to be happening. So this will be a gradual um, launch and um, exit out of the lake. And all of these are going to be connected to the Trans Canada Trail through an accessible boardwalk. Um, and then linking right to the canoe house here, which is the, the big yellow square. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, so that, again, ease of transfer between all the pathways. The portage, which is connecting the Trans Canada Trail down to Ashburnham and down to the museum, is also imagined to be fully accessible. Um, same with all the entrances in the building. So the grounds and the building uh, fully accessible so that it's a, it's a space that can be enjoyed by everybody. Um, moving along here, um, this is a campfire circle area being designed for programming so that it is run by, you know, open and closed by the Canoe Museum, not for weekend parties by the neighborhood. Um, but this is a space that we'll, we'll manage very closely. Again, pathway to it. Um, for those of us that are thinking this site's pretty awesome for events, um, we've asked our site civil team 
to design, and this has not been an easy thing, but this is a beautiful big flat area that <laughs> sounds not that interesting, except that it's perfectly sized to fit one of the largest marquee tents you can get on the market. So that if, when we want to do a large outdoor gathering, whether we host it or somebody wants to rent the facility to have a large outdoor event, it can be set up here, there'll be power and it's got the most stunning view and the amenities of the museum right nearby. Um, and then we've got, of course, this constructed wetland, which will be such a cool feature to have on the property. So this is naturalized with native plants. Um, it becomes a program space, a learning space for environmental education. But it's also, a, it'll be a really neat opportunity for habitat to be recreated through the restoration work that's going to have to happen on this property. And Jeremy, what am I forgetting here? Uh, have I got it all? Gathering circle, right front. Go gathering circle, sorry, I was trying to give you the mic. Oh, okay, well, here we are at the Eastern um, portal onto the, onto the property. Uh, north is to the right. Uh, it's a bit odd with this layout, but it's the best way to present the property. And so it was important to have a, as the door faces east to the museum, that's an important teaching carried into this place, but we wanted to have a moment as you approach the museum uh, to stop, take pause, take in your bearings and to create a gathering place. And so this, this area under my clumsy blue circle is going to serve many roles and we're giving some real attention with our landscape architects right now to um, bringing some excellence into this to making it really quite special. Well said, thank you, Jeremy. And so with this um, overview of the, of the site that's being developed, why don't we take a little peek into the museum and um, just to set it up. So this is an architectural, so this is an in progress work, all right? Not final, it's not a beautiful rendering. This is, this is very much uh, checking out a, Oh, I love my internet. I was doing so well. <laughs> oh, and we're going back in. Hold on one second. All right. Can everybody see this screen? Yes, I see some nods. Wonderful. All right. So let's hope this runs rather beautifully. And if it not, all right, so people can hear me. Here we are. Great. Shall I, uh, shall I take it for a test drive to get started, Carolyn? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give all her a go. Right. Well, you, you remember me mentioning the gathering circle and here it is on our left. All right, we're back. All right, I'm starting again. Here we go. Okay, so I think I might, as everybody can hear me and see me, or you can't see me, but you can see the oh, video. Seems smoother now. Okay, all right, I turn my screen off. 
All right. So we are coming in from the east, as I mentioned. Hello, gathering circle. Uh, this is also uh, a rain garden which serves to capture and filter water uh, from the property before it leaves uh, into the adjacent creek. And we're coming towards the main entrance and the curtain wall. This building uh, is clad in Corten. This is the oxidized steel plating that gives us the siding of the building. And I want you to notice the signage as we come in. Uh, the first name above to all is Jiman Kino Magawin. Uh, Jiman Kino Magawin Canoe Teaching and Learning Place, uh, Canoe School, uh, Place of Learning. And uh, we're thrilled to have this name. This is standing for um, all of the signage and wayfinding on the property uh, that you can expect that will be in three languages, English, French, and of course, Michisagi dialect, uh, Anishinaabemowin. Coming through the entrance, we have, um, this is all wood treatment that we've brought to the project uh, with the architects and the integrated project delivery model. If anything, the internal treatments are getting richer and the palette more exciting than we uh, had originally imagined. And I just wanna uh, kudos to the team for working very hard to ensure that we don't end up compromising, especially in the, with the difficulties of construction at this time, cost escalation. You'll see another uh, view of that suspended feature. I'm just gonna pause for a moment to do a technical check. Turning video off, how's that? All right. Ooh, sorry everybody, this is, uh, this worked in our test run. Okay, I'm gonna pretend it's all working well and we're coming now into the atrium area along connectivity on bench on the left by the curtain wall. And we are approaching the reception area. Of course, this is a key point position on your right for mm -hmm. our volunteers, welcoming, greeting guests, getting them started their journey. We'll see it again on our way back. New offerings here at the Canoe Museum, an amazing cafe. This is gonna be quite a swinging hot spot as a community hub on the east side of Little Lake. There's no similar offering here. Um, and great food provider uh, being uh, retained right now. And we're just passing the most stunning uh, fireplace. You can imagine this, we've always called Carolyn's Fireplace who's championed uh, wood burning feature in this element here. And please note, as you go by Kanawha Museum. That is the original sign from the first museum home um, where this collection was first gathered so many decades ago. And so it's fitting that it's there as a, as a, as a, as a origins uh, story, I guess, to this museum um, within this new home. Stepping out onto the patio uh, outside, onto the terrace outside the cafe, this is your launch point. Well, it's a great spot to have your cafe, coffee or tea and scones, but also a great launch point to get you out onto the water. All of the museum's intention is to inspire and get your butt outside and, and uh, discover and make your own connections outside. Well, I'm gonna have to jump ahead. There we are, there's the photographer and we're going to, coming back around and we're gonna go back into the cafe um, and you'll see another view of the reception areas here. Outdoor fireplace as we go by for the shoulder seasons. Again, it's just that, that, that ethic of authenticity and everything in this building. We, we try to not have things um, brought in that are a representative of themselves. This is real wood. This is mass timber and cross laminated timber, Canadian woods. Um, and then all kinds of other treatments brought into this space. This is also proving to be, be a great place to feature a number of watercraft from the museum's collection. That's a 36 foot birch bark canoe made by uh, the team here at the Canadian Canoe Museum with some amazing volunteers working on that canoe overhead, 36 feet hanging over the front desk. You may remember that story. Artisan Studio, Canoe Building Studio on the left. Uh, we'll see another view into this in a moment, but right now, as we race towards the public washrooms on our right, we're gonna keep going and we're gonna step right into the collection hall. Of course, again, this will all be in three languages. The donor walls on your left here, just a very simple gesture in the architectural design for that, but we're well into designs of the, uh, the donor wall and other signage and wayfinding really excited palette being generated with our architects uh, colleagues at Let Studios. 
So just a few of the canoes moved into the collection hall here. You can see we've chosen just to bring in the orange ones, uh, many more. <laughs> Uh, but at the end of the day, there will be, there will be uh, roughly 550 canoes uh, sitting on uh, storage cradles on the cantilevered racking. This whole room has been designed, if you can imagine, around a four direction long load forklift that lets us lift and lower uh, the watercraft to bring them down for visitation by uh, people who have reasons to spend time with it or to exchange uh, exhibits upstairs bring canoes off of exhibit, bring them down for resting in the collection hall or uh, the reverse of that, uh, bringing canoes and kayaks upstairs to work into a new exhibit. So one of the cool things with the Living Tradition Center is to be able to actually have the programming spaces out front and part of the visitor experience so that you're seeing and hearing all the activity whether you come to do a course or not. So this is where we'll be running paddle making workshops and adult courses, pack baskets, uh, canoe making, canoe restoration. And these big black boxes are of course, equipment in the mill shop um, so that we've got all of the necessities to be able to look after the work that we need to do ourselves. We're a very independent organization right now and that we make and build what we need. And we plan on doing that in the new museum as well. So that be new exhibits, or it might be bits and pieces for programs, or it might be components for more outdoor furniture. This is a beautiful shot just to the reception desk on your right, again, with the canoe overhead and the views to the front door out to the out to the main entrance. And then you've got a shot of the retail space as well. So more open concept retail with these movable um, millwork pieces. We've got the ability for that to be, um, I guess, available more often than not, um, because upstairs is where you're going to find the event and education space, the archive, as well as the exhibition. So everybody coming upstairs or going in the elevator is going to go through past the retail space. This is one of those moments that we wanted to we wanted to make sure was in the plan. So a view into like a bird's eye view into this amazing collection hall. Again, so it's not pulled away, tucked out of sight. This is a collection that needs to be accessible. It needs to feel alive. It needs to be loved. And in order for that, it needs to be part of everybody's reality. So we really are excited that it's coming forward. Heading up the stairs to the loft so this is the lookout space of the new museum so this is an area where again it's a pause to take in the stunning mass timber and the columns and this beautiful atrium public space and to see the busyness downstairs this is also as everybody can see it right now an awesome event space for exhibit openings or art gallery um, or sorry art gallery um, um, installations gallery installations um, trade shows you name it can be hosted inside here we are taking a peek at the past the education and events center we're going to just poke our noses into the exhibition hall. This is not, um, as you know, the exhibits are not being done by the architects. So this is just a, a glimpse into, um, into the space. And this will be developed further um, in the next couple of months and be embedded into this overall rendering. So heading back out past the washrooms on the left. Again, you're on the upper floor. You're gonna just, we're gonna deke into the events and education space. And this is a room that will accommodate 190 people in theater style, 160 in banquet. Next year, I'm hoping that we're able to host our AGM in this space. Oh man, it paused mm -hmm. on me. There was much debate of whether this would run from uh, whether I could get this to work from home and it is not cooperating. I'm sorry, everybody. This is the nature of rural internet. Even Elon Musk did not make this better for me. <laughs> sorry, I shouldn't call him out, should I? 
There, can we see this view of the event and education space right now? Yeah. So we've got this, um, so 190 people seated theater style, 160. Oops. Boy, oh boy. All right, we're gonna finish this up and we're gonna get into, there we are. And then we're going to just find something else that isn't video because I'm going to lose my mind and I'm sure many of you are as well. Hey, well, yeah, are you heading in? Excellent. There's a new development with this space, a few new developments. You can see uh, some really interesting wood treatment here. This is becoming a real signature space that reflects the Canoe Museum. A lot of wood and, and canoe and kayak frames overhead. You can't forget you're at the Canoe Museum, but here is an amazing found opportunity uh, that we've brought into this project. Very excited. This is an enormous west-facing lakefront upper terrace uh, that lets us spill out from the, the events and education room. It also has a back stairs um, as, a, as an egress, as a fire escape to the second floor uh, to get down to ground. Now, when we come out these doors, I just want to pause because one of the most important features of the entire museum uh, from the perspective of the curator here is right here, Carolyn. Oh, you, you got to stop, 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 stop. It's right there. That is the <laughs> crane. This is the canoe lifting boom. This is not the best view of it. We've passed that a little while ago, but I didn't want to interrupt you. But when you are managing a large watercraft collection on two stories, uh, there is a 28 foot swing arm with a hoist. And this lets us uh, with a little bit more expertise and, and specialty equipment that is not seen in this rendering, move canoes upstairs and downstairs. I actually personally love this feature just because it speaks to the practical values that are baked in uh, and expressed in so many ways to this project. All right, let's go into the archives uh, and research and knowledge center uh, just for a quick peek. This is also an amazing space, not an offering here currently at our at, at 910 Monaghan. This is the reading room archives and archival storage. It's a beautiful space. Of course, we've got uh, mass timber, laminated timber panels here, lots of wood, and then compact storage for rare books, archives, photographs, uh, and also uh, a special room that's acoustically separated uh, to do uh, audio recordings, oral histories. So it's a space to care for, manage, and to, um, to, to record stories that are both written and oral. Okay, let's try. Mm. Let's, let's toss our luck on a fly through here of the new site. Go, take it, Carolyn. Well, I so again, apologies for the the rendering and and how much internet it's it's eating up to make that work. But I I hope that it's given you a sense of the amount of development that's taken place on this project um, over the last year. We have we have moved leaps and bounds to make this museum come to life. And today, um, I am happy to report that the building is, is coming out of the ground. We started construction in October, but now we've got foundations well underway and we're starting to, um, we're starting to do all the pours. And, and this week they were actually pouring the slab inside the building. This will be our final finished floor and sharing with you right now. So Ted on the Shando site supervising team gets out his drone every Monday and he takes us pictures. And so this is just this incredible shot of what our building looks like today. Cause I know many of you are not able to be in Peterborough and see the development of the museum. Um, like drive by it and see how it's how it's changing each and every day but this is our site so you've got you can start to see the curve here at the south end which we were looking at earlier this is the fireplace here under my cursor you've got the doors here out to the terrace this is the big uh, staircase at the at the south end um, that'll go up to the administration and education and events space. You've got all these pipe laid, which is exciting because this is going to be feeding the cafe and the kitchen um, reception desk. Uh, we've got at the, you can start to see if, if you sort of follow my cursor back along this east wall, which runs along Ashburnham, 
they've done the pour over there and they're starting to do it on the west side as well. And then the staircase at the back. So this is at the very back of the collection center. So 20,000 square feet of collection center. There's a lot of storage, um, accessible storage being designed into here. So this is the staircase going up at the back. And over to the left, this water that you're looking at is part of that constructed wetland. This is why we have built in to the plan a constructed wetland to be able to provide water management on the property um, in, in times of when there is lots of rainfall or when the water levels are high. And this is keeping the museum safe. Jeremy, what else do you see here? Uh, I, was, I was on mute. Uh, I think you've covered it here, Carolyn. Awesome. Thank you, Jeremy. All right. So we'll maybe have a couple of, do you, well, we can just skip these. Let's just stop share for a second here. And I, where are we? There we are. I'm having some techie issues, folks. So I'm actually going to, I think from a, I think I might open it up to questions and answers if that would make sense. Mm -hmm. Kate, does that seem like a good thing to do right now? Oh yeah, there we are. Um, there was a question in the chat here, Carolyn. Um, Jenny Ingram was wondering how many people can be touring the actual exhibition space at one time by virtue of municipal or fire requirements? Wow. Wow. Jenny, that's a super question. Here I am back. I'm hoping that now that I'm, I'm just wondering if it, what the max is. Yeah. Yeah. My understanding the full occupancy of the whole building is somewhere in around 300 people. Um, and so the question, I think it, it gets a little fussy, but whether there's people in the education room at the same time or down in the cafe, but we're, um, I think we're probably um, in and around 200 people rather comfortably. Um, because the rest of the building will really never be at full capacity all at the same time. That's a nice big bus tour or a number of coach buses, mm -hmm. right? There's, there's a question about parking that I think you can answer easily too. Yes. All right. So, um, John, good question around parking. So there, the majority of the parking is being provided for on an adjacent lot. So right across Ashburnham Drive, um, there is a signalized crosswalk that the project's building, and that's going to give us a safe access across Ashburnham. And there are um, more than 100 spots across the road. And then on our site, we're going to have 12 spots plus all of the accessible, um, the accessible spots and a drop-off zone that's dedicated to um to buses and or cars or and or um of course just so that it's a really easy drop off and pick up location there's benches there as well and the meeting circle um is also going to just make for a, a sort of a much more um enjoyable spot to sit and wait and of course cafe shop cafes and shoppers there's they can pop in right at the building or they can park just across the road for those that are coming by canoe um, that we're going to, which there will be. Um, so whether you're pulling your boat up to the actual docks and tying off the docks, or if you wanna carry your canoe, we're gonna be putting some racks on the grounds so that people can secure their boats to the racks or they can bring them up closer to the, to the, pro to the main museum entrance. Yes, there'll be wide racks, Bruce. <laughs> 
enough. <laughs> <laughs> there will be one um, dedicated wide rack for those who like extra wide wood canvas canoes. Yep, guaranteed, Bruce. Oh, I love oh. it. Carolyn and Jeremy, we've also had a question about uh, the elevator. Where is the elevator? Elevator is um, located just next to the reception desk. Uh, and it's a, it's a beautiful elevator. We just, uh, we just decided on the fit and finishes of it. Um, it's big enough also to carry a genie lift from the ground floor to the second floor uh, if we need high lifting into the exhibit hall. So it's a lot of room. The elevator is an essential piece of equipment for us all. It's quite a climb to the second floor. Um, that the that enormous collection hall did push up the second floor height in order to make sure we could care for the whole collection within the uh, envelope. And so I think it will get a lot of traffic, but it's right there. Uh, the elevator is also located right next to some scooter charging stations, um, also for folks who uh, need to plug and reload while they're visiting. Just one elevator. Thank you. Uh, next question we have is, is the museum accessible by motorboat? Oh my gosh, yes. Um, so right now, um, so the, we've got a docking permit op um, that's in application right now with the Trent Severn Waterway. So probably, hopefully by next, well, next year we're gonna be opening and we'll be, have the docks in place, but the, um, the imagined location for motorboats to arrive to the museum will be to use the um, a reach at the opening of the canal. So this has actually got the proper infrastructure for boats, the right tie-off spots, and um, as we've learned at the when we were working through the lift lock project, the intersection of paddled watercraft and power boats. It's it's complicated, and from a risk management point of view. Um, the, we're going to try to keep the main docks as for watercraft, um, self-propelled watercraft, and those that are coming um, um, from power boats are going to be docking up at the Trent Severn uh, Canal. And for those that aren't too sure how far away that is, it's, it's about a two-minute walk or like a 30-second bike if you have to have one of those cute little bikes on the back of your boat. Um, but this will be a major a major component. People staying overnight will, um, most people are parking at the marina or actually mooring at some of the different locks. Um, again, it's all connected by trails and these are well-serviced trails. So there'll be lots of connectivity for the for folks that are traveling through the Trans Severn system. Um, and we'll be working really closely with our tourism partners like Peterborough Cortha Tourism and the city of Peterborough and also through the Trent Severn Waterway themselves to make sure that the Canoe Museum is, is really well profiled in the literature, but also as part of, um, as we're working through signage and wayfinding on the trails and from the locks as well. Okay, and I Hopefully think you, that answered the question. Uh -huh, and I think you, you answered the next question, which was appropriate was signage that? to pull in the Trent Severn power boaters. Yes, we need to have good signage, yeah. So we do um, have, uh, I there don't was know a, uh, There was a good question up there, Kate, just about water levels that I know Emily answered mm -hmm. um, that David Reeves asked. And, and the question, um, we've actually, we had a project meeting just yesterday and um, thankfully we were expecting much higher groundwater levels on this site um, than we've actually experienced, even though the trend is up. And we've also had a very, a number of big storms and a lot of wet events and a lot of rain this spring. Um, so thankfully, we do not have the groundwater issues or the high water levels on the site that we were anticipating. And we've, able, we've been able to retire some of that risk um, or soon to retire some of that risk. Um, so thankfully, we're not seeing. And honestly, that um, you saw the image of the stormwater management pond that is functioning really, really well. And we haven't even had to uh, address that in the ways that we imagined in terms of releasing. So we're really pleased with how this site is performing for the Canoe Museum. Really pleased.
Okay. Um, we have John Everhard is wondering if uh, this might be a terminal for a solar power operated water taxi from downtown Peterborough. <laughs> hey, you, you pointing you pointing at me, Carolyn? All right. Well, uh, not in the immediate plans. Uh, great question. Something that uh, we've been talking about for quite some time. There's a real opportunity to have an accessible shuttle uh, from the far side of the lake across. It's a terrific opportunity, frankly, for a partnership with with somebody who can run an on water service like that, rather than the museum run that internally. I have to say, I have a bit of a folder already of solar powered accessible uh, shuttle ferries that I would love to see somebody build. They can be quite gorgeous and, and highly functional, um, but uh, not, not in our current planning at this point. But a Museum will be open year round. Oh, I saw that. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, absolutely. Um, assuming we're not in this COVID world um, and that the winter proves to be good, the plan is right now we're working towards opening um, the end of June next year. And we will be open back to what we were pre COVID, which was seven days a week. Typical hours were, are, were 10 to 5. Um, so we can't wait to have everybody back on those regular hours. And then, of course, bookings for events. Um, so facility rentals, um, the artisan programming, school programming, group tours, all will be back in full force. And that'll be really interesting to report on next year. <laughs> we'll be uh, sitting in front of uh, you folks and uh, sharing all the good news that's been going on for the last year. Any other questions? Um, Kate, is, what else is there in there? Um, we did have one question asking about the, the recent storm and just wondering, mm -hmm. Yeah, was there any interior damage to the artifacts or the exhibits at 910 Monaghan? Ah, great. Glad you asked. It was pretty traumatic when we first arrived on scene after that, the 130 kilometer winds hitting this tired old factory, uh, which managed to peel back about a 50 by 50 section of roof membrane over the exhibit hall, pulling a roof drain out of the, the roof structure. And another section about 50 by 12 feet long, uh, another raised section, the entire membrane was torn off of that and placed gently in the parking lot, three stories below. Um, yes, there was water uh, in the exhibit hall. I can thankfully report, we can, that uh, it was not uh, raining, literally raining. It was not um, dry, falling on artifacts themselves. It was nearby and it was soaking the carpet. So we had very fast response from a disaster uh, recovery firm. Uh, we had dehydrators, uh, uh, floor fans and uh, dehumidifiers on site almost immediately and uh, moved the collection uh, further from the, the exposed areas. Great support from roofers who were uh, on site and have done a terrific job uh, resealing the roof, reinstalling the roof drains. We're back to watertight condition again. And uh, so that's the temporary fix and there will be sort of more longer term fixes that'll have to be brought into place to restore to pre-loss condition. But we are happily back to watertight in our exhibits hall. Uh, as for the collection hall where I'm sitting tonight, uh, the winds also hit this area pretty hard. Uh, most of it is just fine, although it did blow out about 12, uh, 12 of these factory windows. You can see some behind me. Um, which caused glass to go cartwheeling throughout this space. And in almost all instances, by some miracle, uh, it shattered panes of glass on the open cement floor and scattered uh, bits of glass onto the canoes that are wrapped in plastic bags around me. Um, in one instance, uh, we have found actual impact from a pane of glass on one of the canoes. If you're curious, it's a, it's a beautiful Adirondack guideboat made by Grant in upstate New York. It's a beloved uh, little 14 foot um, fastest fixed seat traditional rowboat in the world. 
uh, and we'll get to uh, restoration and conservation of that at the new museum. But other than that, honestly, we dodged a bullet here with the collection. Um, very grateful for that. Some hand was was in place uh, looking out for these beautiful canoes and kayaks. Um, I think we have, I know we've gone over time a little bit and so grateful for all of so many of you to stay, stick with us. I think we have time for about one more question, Carolyn, and there's a question here about, mm. is there gonna be a backup electric power generator in the new museum? Okay, I need to know who asked that question. There mm -hmm. it is, um, Benjamin, all right. So Benjamin, I need to tell you this was, um, this has been something that uh, when we were validating the project, um, we really did feel that there wasn't a core need um, for, uh, we had life, you know, life safety and the elevator are all being supported well through the, through the, all the emergency measures that are already within the life safety system. But we were wondering after this storm uh, where we were dealing with a, with a water issue, um, in the building it, with the power out, um, we quickly had a, hmm, we need to rethink this. And so I have no shame in saying that because I think it is something that only when you're in these situations do you realize the complexity of trying to set up the right kind of disaster response when it's literally pitch dark, where there are no windows. Right, and there's no windows in our exhibits today, and there's no windows in the exhibits in the new museum or in the collection hall because these are black box spaces. So, funnily enough, Benjamin had a conversation with our electrician today, um, and we are exploring this. Um, it will, it it's likely to be um, some a, a temporary measure that will just assist with a disaster response. Um, we, uh, there are such complex um, air systems in this building that we, we really do, the new building, that we really do want to, um, from, a, from a disaster response, you know, to close the building down and put every, like move everybody out and just let the building sit in its in its temperature is what the conservation team is recommending but i think from a you know if we did have to respond to a disaster we're going to want to have a few mechanisms in place so that um there's been a few other elements that um, we've been talking about um, internally about um, alterations to the to the project so that we can be in the best possible situation and in some ways i mean sometimes there's some there's always a silver lining with the canoe museum because this is one of these journeys that has so many ups and downs and bends and twists that if you can't find the silver lining <laughs> i'm not too sure why you'd stick around this place but uh the silver lining is that the storm has brought these to the long weekend storm has brought these to the front of mind and has helped us hone our thinking on disaster response and also to make sure that we've got the right all of the right policies and coverage and everything else in place so um super question and i know i've expanded into it in other different ways but i think it's important to know that that we're thinking about it really actively because this is um this is a really this is a unique collection that cannot be replaced and so from a risk management point of view all possible uh, efforts need to be taken to make sure now I can't wait to be in a proper purpose-built home for this museum there will be no roof drains that are falling into the exhibit area or into the collection zone there'll be no water that whole north end which is brilliant um, so we're covered that way and we also have a pitched roof not a flat roof in the new museum but um, yeah I'm gonna just stop talking probably let people go have a drink and have their dinner is that what you folks would like to do maybe i'll turn it over to you vicky to close out the evening please um so i'd like to thank everybody for coming and uh for staying for the question and answer and carolyn i'm sorry that you had uh some of your uh problems around the um internet uh, but um 
that's that's part of the world we're living in right now and uh, i'd like to thank everybody and i'd like to welcome the new board members um and we will all be gathering shortly i hope in person at some point to uh tour that new site and um look at all the things we've done so thank you very much and look forward to seeing you all in the near future take care and have a good evening <laughs>